we started our project, we had the following hypothesis that we could develop a practical prognostic gene signature that would allow for one, improved staging, and two, identification of patients that were probably most likely to benefit from adjutant therapy. And our specific aims were to develop this practical molecular tool to identify high risk early stage patients. And we also wanted to inject this molecular tool again to large scale blinded clinical validation. So we set up our study in a particular fashion. One, we had to first develop the assay and the technology to measure gene expression more reliably in a medium other than the frozen research grade tissues, which we'll talk about in a second. But we had this basic overall idea that we could take patients from UCSF, which was our home institution, and measure a limited amount of genes. One of our strong tenets early on was that looking at a small select number of genes will give you about as much information as looking at hundreds and thousands of genes because we found out through pilot studies that it was really just a few key players that were driving the majority of the information that was given. So these smaller gene signatures were almost basically as good as the incredibly difficult and unwieldy gene signatures that involved thousands and even tens of thousands of genes. And we wanted to develop a very practical assay that would give us a prognostic algorithm that could then be independently validated again in a blinded clinical fashion in two large cohorts. And we were luckily to partner with two cohorts that were international in nature. The first was Kaiser Permanente of Northern California, and this had the advantage of also being a community-based setting. So this was lung tumors as they were resected in the community, stored and archived in the community, and then sent to us for analysis in a non-research institution fashion. And also we were lucky to partner with the China Clinical Trials Consortium, which is a big consortium in China that allowed us to have access to a large international population, which to validate our outcome. So again, as mentioned, the first challenge was to develop an assay that could be used in a practical fashion. And this, we decided, had to be through the use of formerly fixed paraffin embedded tissues or FPET tissues that were commonly used in clinical practice. Whenever any patient gets the tumor specimen respected in surgery, it gets sent to the pathology lab and stored as this particular medium. We knew that all the data was based on frozen samples this far. And we knew this was going to be challenging because these processes that involved formalin fixation and paraffin embedding uh, degraded RNA over time. And we knew that the amplification techniques and the ways to measure RNA expression were non-trivial. They were exceedingly difficult microarrays. And we knew that quantitative PCR was better at accurately assessing mRNA expression levels than f So that's what we chose. We had this challenge. We had these blocks. Had to get somehow information out of these blocks to develop patient prognosis. And, of course, the black box is in the middle, and we had to develop techniques and the ability to basically transform that idea of paraffin blocks into a practical and prognostic assay for patients with lung cancer. When we talk about RNA from frozen tissues, these are the SNAP grade frozen tissues that are used in all of the previous studies. These are tissues that are very high grade. So the RNA that you get for them when you run them on a gel is intact. That's opposed to the RNA that you get from paraffin tissues which is fragmented and cross-linked. And unfortunately, this fragmentation and cross-linking makes it very degraded, and it's shown in this gel also, side by side, and it's very difficult to extract information. So again, we had to develop novel techniques, or more than that, we had to define them specifically for lung cancer tissues. I won't go through all the details of how that was done, but there were three key steps that we found through various trial and error, and all of our experimentation were, one, using gene-specific reverse transcription, Two, pre-amplifying our cDNA prior to PCR amplification. And three, and I think this is very key, using custom-designed tectin acid. So these were basically molecular techniques that were developed specifically for the purposes of this test and specifically for the purposes of working with this tissue. And you could not buy these off the shelf. They're not commercially available. You can't just put this test together. You need to be very carefully thought of what you're targeting and how you're going to target it in order to measure gene expression reliably in this fragmented RNA. So this is an overview of the patients included in our study cohort. There was close to 1,800 patients, by far the largest validation and clinical design of any prognostic test in lung cancer and probably all of cancer. There were over 300 patients that were using the UCSF training cohorts, approximately 400 in the Kaiser cohort, and almost 1,000 in the Chinese validation cohorts. Some clinical differences of note, the age in our Chinese cohort was somewhat younger, and then their counterparts, and there were fewer females and fewer smokers. However, the median survival or the overall survival is similar between all three groups, as well as the histologic breakdown. 
of note in the Kaiser cohort. These were mainly stage one patients. And the Chinese validation cohort and the EGSF cohorts included later stage disease as well. We had picked basically 11 genes through a pilot study that we had um, published in 2008. And this pilot study started with over 200 possible candidate genes and whittled it down to between 60 and 80 potential genes, which we then ran quantitative PCR on. And we really identified 11 key genes we thought were key for prognosis in non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. So these 11 genes were the ones that we then went on to use in the CTSF cohorts on these 350-some patients that we then tested using these paraffin blocks that were available to us. The algorithm was developed on the CTSF training cohorts. Ultimately, after the extraction of all RNA, we ended up with 337 patients with usable samples. And these 337 patients, the gene expression of these 11 genes that we identified were measured in all of these patients, and then we developed a prognostic algorithm. They're really related to the patient's risk of mortality within five years to their gene expression profile. What this really means in layman's terms is how aggressive is that tumor and how likely are you to harbor micrometastatic disease at the time of surgical dissection. These gene profiles are a proxy for tumor aggressiveness, and really aggressive tumors meant that you had a really high risk of passing away, unfortunately, from the disease within five years. So you see as the risk increases in the UCSF training cohorts, the probability of mortality at five years also increases. Once we had developed the technology and measured all these genes and developed the gene expression product algorithm in the UCSF training cohorts, we were then at the point, sort of the moment of truth, to finally and independently validate this product of gene signature in our two validation cohorts. And we were pleased to see that our prognostic gene signature was validated quite nicely in both of our two large international cohorts. And what's striking, actually, is despite the differences in the stage background between these two patient populations, but also, if you think about it, two completely independent international cohorts with different genetic backgrounds, these patients basically acted the same when they were identified by this prognostic gene tool to be either a low, intermediate, or high-risk category. And if you're a high-risk category patient with a tumor resected at Kaiser, Permanente, in Northern California, or in China, your outcome was about the same. That was true even regardless of the stage, because remember, Kaiser cohort patients were all stage one patients. This really spoke to the power of the tumor biology and understanding tumor biology to determining patient prognosis. When we looked at these patients independently by stage in China, you may have thought that maybe this test was just a proxy for stage. All you're doing through this molecular profiling instead of profiling tumor aggressiveness is just profiling tumor stage, and why can't you just do stage? Well, if you break down the China cohort by stage, you still saw good risk stratification by prognostic acid in each one of the stages. So even in stage three, you'd have low, intermediate, and high-risk patients reliably identified by the assay. One other way of assessing whether a test is useful or not is through multivariable regression analysis. This is a way of basically assessing with other common clinical covariates how good is the assay or how good is your prognostic model at identifying high-risk patients over and above what are commonly thought of as typical clinical risk factors. Again, it was striking to see that both in the Kaiser and the Chinese cohort, the high-risk category as identified by the genomic prognostic assay was the most powerful predictor of basically patient outcome despite the inclusion of all these other commonly associated risk factors when you see a patient in front of you with lung cancer. And lastly, there's one other way that it's commonly used in the clinic to see whether this prognostic assay or a prognostic feature adds any useful information in the next area under the curve analysis. And the physical description is probably not fully relevant for this audience, and I wouldn't bore you with that, but suffice it to say that by this criteria that's commonly accepted by clinicians, the genetic assay did outperform the conventional measures used to identify high-risk stage 1 patients by the NCPN, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just one minute. So the results of this were published in The Lancet in 2012, and we were pretty pleased by the response, but one of the things that we wanted to push forward is what's now the clinical utility of this prognostic assay? And again, this goes back to a little bit what I was talking about earlier, what's the interplay between the predictive and prognostic biomarkers, and how are they useful in a clinical setting? Well, it turns out both are extremely important, and I hope to give you some examples now of how prognostic 
assay can be immediately clinically relevant to clinicians and the patient. One of the features that we noticed recently was that, as I'm sure a lot of you know, there's been new PT cleaning guidelines that have just recently published in the JAMA. If you have a smoking history between 55 and 74 years old and you meet certain other criteria, you're supposed to now go in and get a PT scan to see whether you have a long tumor. We know that because of CT scanning, there will be a lot more of these small tumors that were not going to be picked up otherwise. That's going to lead to the resection of a lot of small, basically tiny tumors that were found through the new lung cancer CT screening guidelines. And so we thought to ourselves, well, A, is that a problem? And B, if it's a problem, what are we going to do about it? In terms of not whether the CT screen is a problem, but if you have a small tumor that's resected, now we're going to suddenly have millions of more of these small, tiny tumors resected. And are they dangerous? And if they're dangerous, is there anything with our current methods that we can do about them? It just so happens that these tumors are actually very dangerous. So if you look at tumors that are less than two centimeters that we know have not spread anywhere, we published reports for T1A disease, which is what we're talking about, tumors that are less than two centimeters. You'll see that up to a quarter of these patients die within five years. In our particular validation cohorts, we had 269 of these patients in the Chinese and Kaiser cohorts, and over 30% of these patients were dead within five years. So these tiny little tumors actually do matter, and they do impact mortality quite significantly. And the second question is, okay, if the prognosis is not good if you have these little tiny tumors. Remember, we're going to pick up potentially hundreds of thousands of more of these tiny little tumors that are going to get resected in the next years. What are we going to do about them if they're so deadly? And the current guidelines do nothing about them because there's nothing we can do about them. There's never been any proven benefit giving these patients additional therapy. There's never been any proven benefit giving these patients radiation or chemotherapy. So the current standard of care by both the ASCO and the NCCN is just observation. We can't be satisfied with that result. And so one of the things we did is go back and assess our validation cohort and say, well, for our assay, is there anything that our assay can offer to these patients who will now go on to be detected and resected at very early stage disease? And they may go to their oncologist, and their oncologist may say, well, you have 25% chance of death within five years, but we're just going to watch you closely. Now, potentially, we could offer them prognostic information, a genetic test that helps them clarify what their risk stratification is and may clarify in the minds of those treating physicians whether anything else should be offered to these patients. So we went back and we looked at our validation cohorts. We had 270 tumors that were T1A disease, less than 2 centimeters, and were also node negative and had no metastases, so T1A and 0 m 0 tumors. And we were able to show that our assay reliably identified patients with almost 50% risk of mortality at five years. And through this multivariate analysis, which I just described, was, again, a very, very strong predictor of risk when you were a high-risk patient with this disease. This other common statistic that we talk about this area under the receiver operating characteristic curve analysis, again, this is a great benefit over the conventional criteria that were used by the NCCN to identify high-risk patients. These results were just published two weeks ago in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. That tells you that patients who will now be detected with very tiny tumors the acid that was developed or any genomic prognostic assay been clinically validated on a large scale may potentially be clinically useful to those patients because now we can stratify those patients quite accurately, even if they have tiny little tumors. The second utility that we can think about and it can already be used in the clinic today is identifying high-risk patients. So if you look at the current guidelines, these are the most recent guidelines, I believe, that are published by the NCCN on how to treat non-sulfa lung cancer. If you start with the left, you start with surgical resection. If you track this all the way to the right, then you follow stage 1B disease. Stage 1B disease, if it gets all surgically resected, the current recommendation from the NCCN is equivocal. You can either observe these patients or you can, if they say, consider chemotherapy in quote-unquote high-risk patients. Now, if you then go on to see what the NCCN defines as high-risk patients, they define poorly differentiated tumors, that's their invasion, wide resection, tumors greater than 4 centimeters, visceral flow involvement, etc. And it just so happens that with the exception probably of tumors that are greater than 4 centimeters, then none of these clinical factors that have been identified by the NCCN really have a lot of strong clinical trials validating their prognostic significance 
Yes, the recommendation is that adjuvant chemotherapy should be considered for these patients. If that's the case, if we're making clinical decisions based on what makes intuitive sense to the NCCN is identifying patients with quote-unquote high-risk tumors because they know that these tumors are so dangerous to patients, why not use a clinically validated prognostic assay that can tell you that, that these patients in a clinically validated rigorous way have really been identified as being high-risk patients? So the last topic we'll talk about is a new staging paradigm. So you can use this information that's from a prognostic assay to look at tumor biology help stage your patients. And there's been a big call for this recently with the lung cancer staging guidelines, the new guidelines that were adopted in 2009. Part of that adoption, there was a footnote at the bottom that said, we couldn't use molecular information, but boy, would we like to. And here is an example of how that can be used. So you take patients that are low risk, you bump them down a conventional stage. You take patients that are high risk, you bump them up a conventional stage. If you apply this in the ECSF training cohort of early stage one for QA patients, you'll see that doing this helps you immensely with risk stratification and helps you identify patients who are at high risk of dying from their disease and patients who are actually going to probably be okay after the section of their disease. If you apply reclassification statistics, which is a new way to look at and compare risk prediction models, you'll find that with the addition of tumor biology, 70% of patients get reclassified. There's an increase in the accuracy of their classification in over 20% of all of these patients, and the ability to distinguish between who's going to live and who's going to die improves by almost 25%. So in the future, I think that you'll probably open a textbook and you'll probably see something like this. Instead of a TNM staging system, you'll probably see a TNMB staging system, which B stands for biology, and whoever this gets assessed, you can do this now today with the assay that we developed, and you can risk modify and you can assign patient stages based on what their TNMB profile is and B take into account what the molecular biology of that tumor is. So we do have a randomized control trial planned for the future. This will help us identify patients that are at high risk, the utility of adjuvant chemotherapy in that setting. I won't go all through the details in the interest of time, but for those who are curious, we do have a trial under that. So in conclusion, I hope I gave you a little overview of the prognostic and predictive molecular biomarkers that exist today. They are here to stay. They are already being used in the clinic, and there's great promise in their future for the evaluation and treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. We described a little bit of the practical molecular acid that was developed by our laboratory, and then I went over the different ways that I thought were maybe clinically useful and immediately relevant for this audience and how prognostic assays may help us identify high-risk small tumors, you may identify high-risk stage 1 tumors, for which the NCCN says to consider chemotherapy, and they may ultimately evolve our cancer staging paradigms. So thank you again, Dr. West, for inviting me to present today. Thank you to everybody who made this work possible. Thanks for listening. If you like and learn from our Grace Cast, you can subscribe on iTunes by just searching for the term Cancer Grace, find podcasts in the subject you want, Pick a format of audio or video, and then just click subscribe. It's that easy. And for those of you who don't want to miss any of our programs, there's even a feed for all subjects. You can also find us on YouTube at Grace for Cancer Info. And that's the number four in one word, Grace for Cancer Info. Finally, if you haven't been there yet, please check out our Grace website at www.cancergrace.org. And don't forget that donate button in the upper right. Our content, which helps tens of thousands of cancer patients around the world every month, is made possible by your support.